We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. When I ask my witnesses about what makes their life meaningful, I often get the answer family. What they normally mean is their husband or wife and their children. However, there are other important members of our family that are often overlooked, our siblings. On today's edition, we take a deep dive into adult sibling relationships and ask, how do you get on with your brothers and sisters? Are the bonds close and affectionate? Perhaps you're ambivalent with the relationship marked with ups and downs and truces, or maybe it is strained or even non-existent. According to my witness today, these relationships with your brothers or sisters really matter, not just because of the impact on your mental health, but because they set the tone for how your own children will get on with each other right throughout their lives, including, most importantly, when you're gone. My witness today is Jeffrey Greif, who is the professor at Maryland School of Social Work and the author of 14 books, including the one we're going to be focusing on today, Adult Sibling Relationships. For most of us, our siblings are our one constant in our lives. We outlive first of all our grandparents and then our parents. Most friends come and go, but the people who go right back to the beginning and hopefully are there at the very end are our siblings. However, social scientists have given these key relationships nowhere near as much as attention as they deserve. So, Jeffrey, what attracted you to study adult sibling relationships? Uh, thank you for having me on first, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here and talking to you about what is a vitally important subject to families and to our well-being and to the generations that we live with and those that will follow. I've been interested in working with and understanding families for most of my career, and so this was a natural outgrowth. I tend to think of relationships as being both vertical, meaning intergenerational, and also horizontal. So I had done work on horizontal relationships, which would be friendships. I've uh, studied male friendships in Buddy System, a 2009 book I did on research that looked at men's friendships and women's friendships. And so I followed that up with looking at couples' friendships, how couples make friends with other couples. So moving horizontally or along the same plane as we live in, I realized that sibling relationships are vitally important. They're vitally important to me. I'm the youngest of three with two surviving, obviously, older siblings. And I found that there wasn't a lot of research on adult siblings. People have looked at how kids get along, and that certainly is also vitally important. Here, we're looking at adult siblings ages 40 to 90 are in our research. And again, I credit my co-author, Michael Woolley, a colleague of mine at the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland. So I just want to mention his name, too, as being very important in working with these relationships. And just one more point about this, we've looked both qualitatively and quantitatively at siblings. And why do you think your colleagues have been slow to take up this area? Because once you stop and think about it, these are incredibly important relationships. People who go from the beginning to the end, there are not many of those. Yeah, I think that we, following along Freud and a lot of other long ago and you know currently important theories, have looked intergenerationally at parent-child relationships and also at intimate relationships. So when you consider, and we did some research on this 
why do people go into therapy? It's often around two areas, family relationships, meaning parent-child, and also couple, meaning intimate relationships. So this is really sort of the third wheel and drives people into therapy, but not to the extent that their relationship with their parent or their child does or with their intimate partner. That being said, we're trying to say, yes, it's not as maybe often talked about in therapy, but it is an important thing for therapists to look at. Therapists don't ask about it, and we're trying to say, hey, when you're talking about parent and child relationships and you're talking about intimate partner relationships, don't forget that siblings play an important part in one's life too. So what is your relationship like with your siblings? Great question. I have a sister who's six years my senior and a brother who's three years my senior. We all get along, I think, remarkably well. I think that has to do with the good luck of the way we were raised. A lot of what happens to adults, to us all, is a matter of luck. We can get born on the right side of the tracks, the wrong side of the tracks from a financial point of view. That's just luck. We can get born into a group that may be more historically oppressed than other groups. That's luck. We can also be born to a parent or parents who get along well, who do not have a lot of genetic challenges or or abilities or disabilities. A lot of that is luck how we come into the world. We still have to play the hand, but we are dealt different hands in life, and that should never be gone unappreciated. I was born into a family of two parents that were very loving with each other and stayed married throughout their life. That's luck. So on a sort of monthly basis, how much would you see or contact your your siblings so we get a sense of what it's like on the ground, so to speak? So we all live within maybe 10 miles of each other. My brother and I play tennis together as a doubles team a lot at a local club. He and I are in a poker game that I reference in my book on male friendships, where we play twice a week. We played last night. That game's been going on for 60 years, <laughs> uh, the players in that. So we know each other. There's a great deal of trust. It's not about the money at this point. It's just about getting together. The stakes are relatively low. So I have a lot of contact with my brother and also a lot of contact with my sister, though not as much as I have with my brother, because he and I share male activities, sports, tennis, golf, and poker uh, together. So what about your wife? How does she get on with her siblings? That's a great question. She has a greater struggle with her siblings than I have with my siblings. And I've learned a lot from how she has managed her siblings. Her mother was estranged from her sister. So there's a little bit of a question about what's the intergenerational hand down in my wife's life. And has that caused a disjuncture or a rupture in her own relationships with her siblings? Or is that relationship that is very strong with one sibling and less strong with another? She has two younger sisters. Was that learned or was that just something that would have happened regardless even if her mother and her siblings had been very close so you get this notion of how do we learn to manage our own relationships how much of it is from our childhood how much is it from our ongoing relationships with our siblings as adults do we pick up that from how we were raised and then you have two different people, if you're partnered with somebody, each are spinning in their own world with their own siblings. And how might a spouse, how might I comment to her about her siblings? Or how might she comment to me about, you should call your sister, you should call your brother to wish them happy birthday? How much are we influenced by our partners? And how much of that is based on their own upbringing and their own projection of that upbringing onto our relationship. So what have you learned exactly from your wife that's been helpful, do you think, for your studies? I think I've learned from my wife that what can seem to be un 
repairable, if that's a word, can be repaired over time, that as we age, we learn to let go of certain things and place relationships in a certain part of our of our life where we can use them as we need to. This goes into the narrative that we want to leave for ourselves or the narrative under which we want to live. Do I want to have a relationship with my sibling or does my wife want to have one with her sibling where there's no contact or where there's contact in a controlled way that works for her and is less uh, less painful? but is sort of put into a box. And when you think about your life relationships, I have a new book out on in-law relationships. You know, how did I manage my relationships with her parents? In a mature way, you begin to sort of put them in a certain place and say, I get my father-in-law, I get my mother-in-law, I'm not going to change them. It's important to stay in contact. They're not bad people at all. They're, They're very nice people. We are not on the same wavelength, but it's important to me and maybe for my wife to maintain a relationship and to not keep on agitating that relationship and to put it someplace. And I think that's how you balance all your relationships in life. You learn what to, you know, when to hold them and when to fold them, to quote Kenny Rogers, and not just sort of keep on going after something that it's like, wait a minute, take a breath and step back. I love the idea of Kenny Rogers as a great uh, philosopher. And, (laughs) you know, I often say to my clients, you've got to choose which battles you're going to fight. Don't bother fighting about the cold pizza, you know, fight about the verbal abuse. So, you know, you're actually fighting about the things that really matter. Exactly. Very wise. So let's look further down your family because your children are now of the age that they have children of their own. How are you seeing this sort of feeding down? Because in a sense, they've had two role models. They've had, you know, best buddy brothers and they've had sisters who have had to work hard at staying civil to each other is I think the message I'm hearing from you. Yes. And I think we're very lucky, my wife and I, that our daughters are fabulous human beings and they get along with each other very well. I can say they're each other's best friends, but that's hard to sort of quantify, but they are extremely close. We live in Baltimore, which is near Washington. They live up in in Boston and they live two miles from each other. And it's not by chance that they're both in Boston. The younger one who was in Chicago graduated with a degree in social work, as a matter of fact, and I'm a social worker. And she moved closer to her sister, who is a psychologist. So the apples didn't far from fall far from the tree. I think part of it is, of course, luck. Part of it is though something I learned from my parents, which is very important in raising children and maybe even more important with adult children, is that when you're with that child, your own child, you're with that child, and you never talk about the other child. So I learned from my parents when they were with me, they weren't saying, oh, your brother and your sister did this or that. There's essentially, and I buy this wholeheartedly, when I'm talking to one daughter on the phone, I don't say, did you hear about what happened to, unless it's, of course, of of life-threatening or a health reason, we don't chat about the other daughter. When we're with one daughter, we're, we're with them. And I think it's important in families to have that kind of boundary discussion with a relationship with your own child or with your parent, that when I'm with that daughter, I'm not bringing up what the other daughter has accomplished. Isn't it great that so-and-so got promoted or her, her failings? It's, and I don't talk about their kids. That They each have two kids. I'm talking about that daughter's children, that daughter's spouse. They're, they're both married to men. And that's, that's where the conversation goes. And that is the most beautiful piece of advice. I have never, ever heard that one before, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to treasure it because I think that the problem is a lot of the time there seems to be 
whether parents want it or not, a bit of a competition between siblings. And this is the most beautiful way to say, you know, you are important to me. And I also, the other thing I like incredibly is the idea of having time with each child alone rather than it always being both children. I think that is something that's really important and is often overlooked. Would you agree with me on that? Yes, I would. And and again, talking about good fortune, when my wife and I go up to visit both daughters in Boston, we don't stay together. I go with one daughter because they have space for us. I mean, that's the fortunate part. And she goes with the other daughter. So then if, if I'm with daughter A in May and we go up in June, I'm then going to be with daughter B and she, she'll be with daughter A. And we very carefully keep track of that. And there's no reason for me to travel with my wife and see the same daughter. because I know what my wife's going to say, she and I communicate. I don't need to hear her retelling stories. I want to focus on that, that one daughter. And that's been very important. And when they come to visit us, sometimes they all eight come down, both families. But we say, you know, that's great if that's your schedule, but we also like having you each alone with us too, with with your kids and your husband, if they're free to join for the visit. So for your research, you studied adult siblings over 40. Why was 40 the important age to start? I think that's a great question. And that's a research question. And it's, I think for us, it was Michael Woolley and I, at what point do these become a little more stable? Obviously, we're not going to study children, so removing them, but why not 21 to 40? There's a lot of movement in people's lives between the ages of 21 and 40. Well, if we think about the life course, Andrew, you know, one of the greatest challenges in life is how do I grow up and separate from my family while staying connected to my family. Mm. We're supposed to grow up and be independent in most cultures, but there's some cultures where you're not. So I want to make sure that point is emphasized. Some cultures may emphasize greater community, a sense of the communal. But in my culture and many, you grow up and you separate, you partner with somebody, not always. You establish a work life, hopefully, that is possibly different in a different city maybe, but you still have to stay connected to your family in some way because they're a great source of love and and support for you. So how do you do that and stay connected? So there's a lot of fluidity in your 20s about that. You may not have partnered yet. The average age of marriage now is in the late 20s in the United States. And you move on from there. But the other thing that happens at around 40 that I want to get to is that your parents may need you more. So your parents are aging. And I could go off and create my own life when I'm 20, 25, and 30. But if my parents, and avoid my siblings and family or see them on holidays, but if my parents need us, we then have to start to work together again. So there's a new press or new environmental crush that happens in a family when parents get older and the children have to agree what to do about that. And there's more communication that maybe they haven't had to have. And that's where a new set of issues can come up between siblings who have to work together to take care of their parents. So let's look at what you discovered. When you looked at your set of people, you found that 62% found their relationships with their siblings highly satisfying. 70% were neither satisfied or particularly strained, and 21% were strained. Did that surprise you? It didn't really surprise me, of course. You know, every bit of research has, you know, certain strains of weakness in it. So let's not take this as the holy grail. It's just a snapshot of society as written by the people that did the interviews and so on. So I just want to make sure that's clear. So this is suggestive of what may be happening in society. It may not apply to any one family or any society. But I think to say that there are a certain number of relationships that are strained is a fair point of discussion and a good place to start. And one in five, one in six tends to be where we land that I think one in five maybe have strained relationships. I think the more important message is that these can shift over the course of a lifetime. 
that don't think that because, or my wife shouldn't think because she's refusing to talk to her sister for two years, that they can't reconnect later or let bygones be bygones. I tend to think that people that are open to change are going to be influenced by a book they read, a movie they see, the death of a parent or a cousin or a statement that we should always be open to environmental influences that may say, you know what, I really should be telling my wife I love her every day instead of once a week because I heard somebody on a podcast say, you know, it's a lot better if you force yourself or just tell yourself, have you told your wife or your husband or your partner today something good about them and make a note to yourself? I mean, those things can change a trajectory that we get into. Sort of ask yourself, when was the last time I phoned my sister sort of kind of question? And should I be phoning her first or, well, I phoned her first last time and now I'm waiting for her to phone me. And that's just a game that I may not choose to play. And so that's where the narrative about myself comes in. How do I want to view myself when, if we get into, and we should, sibling estrangement and how you handle some of the issues that come up? What narrative do I want to have about myself as a loving person that's consistent with them reaching out to my sister or brother, even if they refuse to respond? Now, I was discussing at Christmas this particular edition of the program with my partner's sister-in-law, and she is currently semi-estranged from her brother. You know, she feels that her brother has, you know, treated her and her family sort of poorly over a, a long time, you know, sort of sitting them at the worst table at the party sort of kind of stuff. And she sort of reached that point where she's thinking, can I be bothered? And what I was talking about from your research was that if you become estranged from your sibling, the likelihood is you're passing either subconsciously or directly the idea that you can ghost your siblings. So the last thing she would ever want would be her two children to end up ghosting each other. But what your research is saying, that if you don't make that effort with your sibling, there is a possibility that your own children are probably going to fall into that trap as well. Am I putting it a bit too strongly? I mean, that really got a really interesting conversation going. because, And I see this a huge amount in my practice. There are a lot of people who don't have good relationships with their siblings, and they sort of say, oh, well, you know, you, you can't choose your family. You can choose your friends. And they sort of write them off. And we think it's a, a low-risk thing to do. But I think your research says that actually it's not such a low-risk thing to do. I think I'd like to say it's something you should keep on your, your radar. You know, there's nothing that's always going to happen because of something else, as, as you know. But I think it's like, okay, if I'm not speaking to my sibling, I better be on guard to not shut off myself emotionally from my partner. And I have to be careful about the legacy it's giving to my kids. So I think because there are times when you obviously should cut off from a sibling too. So I don't want to ignore the people that have been physically or sexually abused or verbally abused and continue to be abused. And they're still putting themselves into that realm where it's going to make them feel better if they say, no, I'm going to put a stop to this because that may teach them to put a stop to other abuse in other parts of their life too. So yeah. you have to sort of look at that as a, the hypothesis is that if I'm estranged from my sibling, hypothesis might be I might be setting up a series of estrangements elsewhere. So I better be aware of that to make sure I don't do it. I think I'd feel more comfortable landing kind of there, that I'm more at risk for it, but it doesn't mean I will end up doing it, but I better be aware of it. If I've cut off or if I'm cut off from my spouse, I better be careful not cutting off other relationships. Or if I'm cutting off friends, it's the same thing. Where's the cutoff and how is that sort of bleeding into other relationships? So how do parents influence the span of their sibling relationships? What are the sort of mistakes that we make that actually put down markers for making things more difficult when our 
children get older? Yeah, there's a question we asked in two ways. We asked, did your parents interfere in your relationship when you were young between your siblings? And a certain percentage, I'll say it's a third, don't quote me exactly. I know I gave you a fraction and not a percentage. Don't quote me exactly there, but somewhere in there were people who said my parents interfered. Now, we did not define the word interference cross-culturally. The respondent was left to describe interference or figure that out for themselves because interference varies from one culture to the next. I just want to make sure that's clear. Those folks who said their parents interfered when they were young tended to have worse relationships now. We also asked, do your parents interfere now? And sometimes it wasn't the same group. So you're looking at a lot of different issues when you're talking about interference. There are times when parents do have to interfere to protect or teach siblings about how to get along or how to stop fighting or how to stop doing something. But ideally, the more parents can sit back and let siblings work some stuff out, which they can't always do. You know, loving parents have to sometimes step in and help kids. It's easier to tell parents of adults to stop interfering because the stakes are not the same and they're not as responsible for their children as they were when their children were under the age of 18 or let's say or under the age of 16, wherever you draw that imaginary developmental Line. So we like to say that it's not only that the siblings shouldn't triangulate in the parent and you tell the siblings, stop going to your parent and stop playing the parent off against each other, but you should also tell the parent to stop doing this. Some people say, well, my mother's too old at 80. No, your mother's not too old at 80 or 90 to be told, stop asking me about my brother when we talk. I don't want to or do it in a nicer way, you know, thank you for your question about my brother or my sister, but let's just talk about us today. So parents can be trained at whatever age, assuming they are of sound mind, to not pull in kids, and kids can be trained to not feed on any kind of interference that parents have. Yes, my my mother used to like to be in the centre of the family and would be a go-between between me and my sister. And most of the time, I would say that doesn't actually work, that you end up getting sort of Chinese whispers. You sort of wonder what comes back the other way and right. vice versa. So it makes things more difficult. So no triangulation. What if you've got three children? Because they can then triangulate themselves. So, you know, child A and B are going to play together, but they're going to cut out child C. And then sometimes around it can be C and B and C and A. Do you step in with that? Or do you think you also stand back? I think the more interesting question that falls into my clearer knowledge is around what happens to that when you're an adult. Mm. Because that may start as a child and then it continues on as an adult and the parent has no role in that anymore. I mean, when it's three kids, it's going to really depend upon a whole bunch of stuff. What's the gender? What's the age span? What exactly is going on? Parents have to always be watchful of what their kids are doing up to a certain age. And again, we can debate that age. Is it 16 or 18? But so parents may have to step in if unfair stuff is going on and do a little bit of instruction. It depends how the parent makes the children feel with that instruction. And it's not an easy level of instruction to give to kids to say, you have to include Susie or Johnny when you're playing and stop stop ganging up on them. It's like when you're doing group therapy and there's a scapegoat. You can't, uh, as a therapist, always defend the scapegoat. You have to go with the people that are scapegoating too because that's as much of an issue for them. You have to be a a parent to all three kids in that case and not just blame the other two for excluding one. 
but it can be difficult and an age appropriate responses are needed. In adulthood though, it can be tough. And a lot of the issues that we got from people are about a sibling being excluded or being scapegoated. And how do you get the family again to come back and, and work together around those issues? And those are very complicated issues, often encrusted in stuff that's been going on for 30, 40 years. We get narratives as adults. My siblings may still treat me as the, the youngest sibling, and I may still act as the youngest sibling instead of acting as a adult peer. So how do you deal with those sorts of things when they make jokes about, oh, you were always that way or whatever. And I want to say, no, I want to be seen as who I am today, not who I've always been. Those are all narratives that we can try and change. They can be difficult to change, though. But it, I think it's probably better to try and change them rather than just bite your lip, because I think that's probably where where the problems come. I would agree with that if that fits the narrative that you have in your head as to who you are today or who you want to be. Do I want to be the person in all my relationships to respond or do I just want to bite my lip and take it? So it depends upon you know, who am I trying to form myself as. If I'm a person who always strikes back and that's been problematic, Maybe I need to hold my tongue more. If I'm a person that's always holding my tongue and that hasn't worked out for me, maybe I need to speak up more. Now, let's talk about favoritism, because the famous thing about favoritism is if you don't think your parents had a favorite, that probably means it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, do you know who the, your parents' favorites were amongst the three of you? I think it varied from uh, different parts in our, our lives. The notion of favoritism is fraught with a number of sidebars. You don't want to be the favorite because that can make you feel guilty. You don't want to be disfavored because that can make you feel lousy. There's a pain to being the favorite and there's a pain to not being the favorite. So with your own parents as the youngest this is, I'm going to show a little bit of uh, prejudice here because both of my parents were youngest siblings and I'm the oldest sibling. Were you the favourite because you were the youngest? Were you particularly cherished? I don't know if I was cherished because of my sibling position or because of who I am. And I don't know if my brother was cherished because of who he was and my sister cherished because she was the first. And of course, families change. Parents' relationship change as new children come along. Parents' financial situations change. Their own relationship changes over this the course of time. So it's hard to sort of pick out exactly who is what, when, and where. But it's important to kind of remember that and you mentioned it, sibling position of parents can affect sibling positions of kids. I know my, in my wife's life, her father, who was a middle child, favored the middle sister. So I think that can go on. Both my parents were, were first born. I was youngest born. But I don't really make much of a sense of that. I think if parents have it together, the notion of favoritism is not a big deal. Some families we interviewed, it was clear. Uh, everybody said, oh, d dad always loved so-and-so the most. And we thought it was funny. They'd go off together and play tennis or hunt or whatever they would do. And it wasn't said with any kind of, of, of animosity. It was like, oh, that's just them. That was always their big deal. So the favoritism wasn't shown in a way that kind of disfavored the ones that were not favored. So I think it depends how it gets played out in a family, how adjusted the folks are in the, in the family, and how much love there is in general. And of course, there are times when a child needs more protection. A child who has a challenge or a disability is going to need more from parents than a child that does not have that. And I think that has to be openly discussed in the family and not done as, as kind of a, of a secret. So you identify different roles that people might have of the placator, the blamer, the computer, and the distancer. And I think actually, I mean, I love these terms. I'm going to ask you to explain about them. And then perhaps you can explain why understanding that is something that's really important for repairing your sibling relationships. 
One of the theorists that we use is the experiential family therapist, Virginia Satir, an American-born woman whose work is well-known for her focus on communication. So if you are living in a family that has a culture of open communication, you're going to be clearly communicating where your verbal and nonverbal presentation are in sync. And that's what you aspire to. So there are families, according to Satir, who we quote in the book, who have family members that may be blamers. They blame the other person for uh, the problems. They may be placators, or we used to describe them as passive aggressive sorts. Oh yes, whatever you want to do, we're going to go ahead and do. And they don't really speak up for themselves. They may be a computer or what she considered somebody who was very well defended and you'd argue with them, but you could never convince them of anything because their defenses were so intellectually strong and they were hard emotionally to connect with. There's also somebody called the distractor. You ask them one question and they answer it a different way. So in quoting Satir, she would say the person who you want to aspire to be is a leveler, somebody who is saying what they feel and are willing to hear back. So you have to be, if you're going to have an open communication style, you have to be ready to take back what you're hearing. And you're not communicating openly in a blaming way, but that takes a lot of strength to both put it out and say, whatever you want to say back to me is okay, and we're going to work through this. So that's one style uh, for families, but you have to have a pretty much of an open, loving relationship to do that because a lot of other families may say, I really am not prepared to hear openly what you're feeling about me. I'd rather keep some of this stuff down. So that style may not work for every family based on their culture and their history. But I think it's a really good idea to actually aim for being a leveller, which once again is you allow to say what you feel. I mean, nicely, you know, this is how I feel. This is how it affects me. Trying to use the word you as little as possible. So it's all about me. I feel shut out when this happens. You can see I managed to miss out when you do this. And you've got to hear the feedback as well. And you've got to listen to it without going, yes, but, which is an incredibly hard thing to do. And you've sort of got to hold it rather than necessarily immediately engage with it. I'm in a writer's group, and one of the most important skills that you have is when you share work with people, they're going to give you their feedback on it. Now, some of this feedback is really useful, and some of it is just their stuff, if you know what I mean. You know, yep. they're they're obsessed with, I don't know, English country dancing, and they're complaining that you've got no English country dancing in your book. And it's no point going on and saying, this isn't a book about English country dancing. You know, you just take what they say and you go away, and it's a very stupid example that I've given, but you go away and you think, actually, is this a helpful piece of advice? Mm -hmm. But you don't have an argument with them about it. Some of the things people are going to say, you're going to think, hmm, you know, when you've actually thought about it, that perhaps the idea of X happening in the novel wasn't a good idea, that it, it sort of somehow distracts from the main theme of it. And in a sense, that's what we've got to do with what our our siblings are going to say to us because, and this is the problem with our siblings, is they really know, they know where our our soft spots are. They know how to stick the knife in and twist it. Right. Well said. And one way to think about the communication style happened in, in my own family, but that had to do with, I had a health crisis. And after I had it, I'm fine. This was nine years ago. My daughters would call me up and say, how are you doing? And I might start to cry. And my wife said, you know, when you ask dad about that, he, he gets very upset. So you, you shouldn't, shouldn't ask him about it. And I had to sit down with all three of them and say, I had to say to my wife, thank you. You're doing this in a loving way, but you're essentially in the middle of my communication with my, my daughters. And then I told my daughters, if you want to ask me how I feel, I'm going to tell you and I'm going to cry. And if, if you don't want to know how I feel, then don't ask me. And the other side of that message is, you're strong enough to deal with me crying. 
So there's also this interesting thing that happens. A lot of, of people try to protect other people. And if you're in general a parent with adult children and you're trying to protect them from your own feelings or your bad diagnosis or whatever, you're keeping it a secret, you're sending them a message. You're not capable of hearing the, the truth from me and us together crying and then moving forward with it. And it happens a huge amount that children, adult children, protect their parents. I mean, I'm doing a, a workshop this weekend on the mother wound, which is about men and their relationship with their mothers. And the thing I hear over and over again is, I can't tell my mother that, it will kill her. So they protect their mother from like 85% of their life. Right. And I don't think we should be protecting our parents. You know, if something is important to us, I think we should tell them because otherwise we're chopping them out of our lives. I mean, I think you would like to hear um, what's troubling your children, wouldn't you? Yes, I would like to hear it. And also, I don't feel like I need protection. So that's the other side of that, of not telling. You're saying to your parent, you're not competent. So what would be the best piece of advice you would give to us to improve our relationships with our siblings? Because I think most of us could be doing better in this category. I think the subtitle of the book after adult sibling relationships could have been affectionate, ambivalent, ambiguous. And by that, I think that, and it took me a while to grasp a lot of this, it's a lot of growth in myself to try and deal with life's ambivalence and ambiguity. So from the research, we found that a lot of siblings have very affectionate relationships with their sibling. Their sibling is their best friend. They trust each other. Trust goes up over the course of, of a lifetime, by the way, uh, between brothers and sisters and brothers and brothers and sisters and sisters. You feel more trust. You compete less over time. So affection is always there. I could say, but I'm going to say, and you also have to realize that life is full of ambivalence. Yes, I want my sibling to, to do well, but not as well as me. <laughs> and that, I think, is a normal reaction. And I shouldn't feel bad for feeling that way. I want them to do well, of course, but there's still something there that's important to be thinking about and to acknowledge in how we go through life. It may not be true of everybody who is out there. It certainly is true of me and other people that I know. So there's ambivalence. And there's also ambivalence because we don't quite always have positive feelings towards our siblings, towards our spouses, towards our children. There's something called intergenerational ambivalence, where you're disappointed in your children's, adult children's choices, maybe, or how they're living uh, their life. Yeah. This is all normal. And, and don't think it has to be a, a Norman Rockwell painting of everything is great. We're all together on Thanksgiving, loving each other. And the other part of this is the ambiguity. There's a lot we just don't understand. Why did my sister marry the jerk she married? Why did my brother marry the jerk that he married? Neither of them married jerks, but those are our reactions. Or how can she still be nice to dad after what he said to her five years ago or yesterday? Why is she still going back and taking the emotional beating, in quotes, from him? So we don't always understand why our siblings act the way they act, and you have to accept that. And how that can often come out is around the death of a parent. People should go into a funeral, siblings should go into the funeral of a parent saying, we're not going to grieve the same way. I'm going to tell a joke sooner than my brother or sister will, or I'm going to cry more. And that has nothing to do with them. That's just me. And let me be who I am. I'll let you be who you are and not put any expectations on. We all have to act the same way. So I think letting people be who they are in all their beauty and with all their warts is something that I've had to learn later in life than I wish I had. So in a moment, we're going to be looking at a letter. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits.
So one of the ways of participating in The Meaningful Life is going to www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, where you'll find out how to sign up for my Substack newsletter and how to write a letter. And this is one that's been sent to us. I am English and my wife is German, and we've been married for almost 20 years and have been together for 25. We moved to Germany from the UK after Brexit with our two young children. After a honeymoon period, I found the stress of being self-employed much greater as I struggled to speak the language and fully engage or cope with a new culture. Although I'd visited Germany many times before moving, living here was a totally different experience. I became more depressed and emotionally withdrawn in my relationship with my wife and children and was somehow living in my own head and not engaging with the world around me. At the end of October last year, I discovered my wife was having an affair that had started two months earlier with someone from her choir. She initially said she wanted to work on our marriage and she cut off contact with her affair partner, but also said she loved me but was not in love with me. Discovering my wife's affair has been devastating, but it's also made me work incredibly hard to get myself out of an abyss. I've dived into reading about affairs and relationships, and I'm becoming the husband and father that I want to be and that my family deserve. Since the affair was discovered, my wife has said she wants to live on her own. We've been getting on much better than we were before the affair, and I feel a lot of warmth and love from her every day. However, she is moving out in the next few weeks and will start going back to her choir and see her affair partner for the first time in about four months. I don't know how I should deal with the separation and my wife having weekly contact with her affair partner. I'm deeply in love with my wife and I want her to find her way back to me. I don't know whether to let her go and try to fall out of love and move on as a single person. I do know that I've been getting stronger over the last few months and there will eventually be a brighter future ahead. But at the moment, I can't see what that looks like. Jeffrey. There's a lot there that is strength-based, and there's a lot there that deals with loss. So I think, number one, the gentleman is going to have to deal with loss and accept loss for what it is, and loss is sad and often debilitating. I admire some of the things he said. I've become the man I want to be, or I'm becoming the man I want to be. Uh, become stronger. So I think there are two pieces here that are floating in the, the ether. One is having to deal with the loss. And secondly, focusing on the parts where he says, I'm stronger, I'm becoming the man I want to be. The other sides of this are that, and I've had to deal with this myself, when I applied for a job and didn't get it, and it was a little bit personally humiliating, I had to role model for my adult children, how do you deal with loss? How do you deal with applying for a job and not getting it? What do I want them to learn from how I deal with loss? So I think part of what it should be in this gentleman's consideration is what message does he want to give to his children about loss and change? My guess is he's not going to get back his wife. My guess is he's going to have to find a way to love her as the mother of his children, but not as an intimate partner. So he can hold on to part of the love for her, but it's going to have to morph more into loving her as a mother of his children. And they're going to be partners in that for the rest of their lives. And having to let go of the fact that she is no longer going to be his intimate partner. So ultimately, He's going to have to rewrite a narrative for himself. Who do I want to be? How do I want to present myself to myself, to possibly new intimate partners, and to my children going forward? And you've done a lot of research on male friendships, and this seems like a time when a male friendship would be very important. I mean, what did you discover about male friendships? Men tend to construct their friendships in ways that are different from women. It may not apply to any particular listener, but men tend to build shoulder-to-shoulder friendships while women tend to feel more comfortable in face-to-face friendships. So you and I, Andrew, are going to get together and do something 
I'll meet you at the bar and we'll watch the game or we'll, you'll come to my house <laughs> or so on and I'll, I'll come to your house. And- I, you're not going to watch the game with me, but uh, we can go to an art gallery together if you'd like. Okay, fair enough. But we will get together and play ch- chess or go over to the corner art gallery or the art store and, and you'll help me pick out a print. We'll do something together as opposed to sitting down and there, there's a great new French restaurant in Berlin. Let's go and have an intimate glass of wine and, and talk. Men tend to feel more comfortable shoulder to shoulder doing things and women tend to feel very comfortable in, in face to face. So that's one of the things to think about how men and women construct their friendships. Men often don't like other men that bleed emotionally too much over them. They don't like a lot of high maintenance male friendships. They sometimes escape from women to their male friends to not have to talk about feelings. It may not apply to anyone listening to this podcast, but it it applies to a, a lot of men in general. So those are ways that he's going to have to figure out how can he connect with other men around things that he likes doing and that reinforces a narrative that he wants to build for himself. So I think I've got a lot to say on this. The first one is, I'm just following on from what Jeffrey was saying, I do think that you need to think about your male friendships because what you need is a support system. And if you start to have a woman as a support system, it can get a bit fuzzy. And certainly if you're trying to work on saving your marriage, you don't really want to have anything that's at all fuzzy. You know, you want to be talking to your male friends. And you know, actually challenging your male friendship, because I think you will find that if you do speak up about your problems, you will get a positive response. They will possibly open up to you about their problems. I'll always remember I had a a client who I was seeing and he was going off to a 20th or 30th university meetup. And I said, are you going to tell your friends you're in therapy? And he said, hmm, that's an interesting idea. I might do it. And when he came back, I said, how did it go? Did you tell them? He said, yes. And he said, guess what? And I said, I don't know. He said, all of the other men were in therapy as well, with the exception of one, and they all agreed he should have been in it. So, (laughs) But it took him opening up to say, I'm in therapy, for the others to actually say they were in therapy. So- If you open up, I think your male friends will open up. So I've got some things to say about this. The first one is, I don't think people can understand how difficult it is to move to another country. You know, I've done it as well. And the German language is not an easy language. You know, there are three genders that uh, decline through different cases and the adjectives have to agree and the sentence. Will, it is very difficult. So I think you have to be kind to yourself. And I think you have to, I think you have to be proud of what you've achieved, that you have gone to another country. The English are very insular. And you've got this wonderful experience where you've actually gone through change. And going through change actually ultimately makes you stronger. So I think you've got some strength you're going to bring to this particular situation. Now, when it comes to dealing with your wife, I want you to think of two categories. Everything fits into two things. We have your column where you have your zone of concern, and then we have your zone of control. And sadly, there's going to be an awful lot more in your zone of concern than your zone of control. So what's in your zone of concern? That your wife is going to be meeting up with this man each month. Is it in your zone of control? No. And if you try and make it, you're going to push your wife further and further away. Now, the problem is, because it's so concerning for us, we want to control it. And unfortunately, however much it concerns us, we still cannot control other people. We put a lot of effort into trying to control other people, which we could use that to actually control ourselves. So we use our energy not to pour out our anxiety every day, for example. Because what you can control yourself is your behaviour and your actions. 
and what you show of your feelings. You can't control your feelings. You're going to feel anxious. But what you can choose is, are you going to show that anxiety or are you going to flood other people with it? So what can you control in this situation? You can control your reaction. So the night that your wife is going out and having this event, what's in your control? Well, that uh, you could set up the fact you're going to go and speak to your friend that evening. So you've got somewhere to pour it out rather than when your wife gets back, pouring it out to her. What's under, under your control is when she comes back, whether you decide to talk about it or not. You know, do you ask a question or don't you ask a question? You know, that is under your control. If it's not under your control, then it really needs to be under your control. So I think if you can get those two things sorted out, you're going to be in a much better place. The next thing I want to say is when we're in pain, we want to get out of that pain as quickly as possible. And the problem is with men, the way to get out of that is to fix it. And, you know, I'm hearing that already in your letter. You know, what am I going to do next? You know, am I going to find somebody else? Am I going to try and win her back? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? And what I want you to do, and this is the hardest thing I'm going to ask you to do, but if you can do it, your life will be really much, much better, is to just sit with these feelings and actually experience them, and you'll find they're not as terrible as you think they are. And if you can sit with this, it's possible that in this space that uh, you are at the moment is that something positive might come out of it. You don't know. But if you keep pushing and asking and trying to get reassurance, which is what lots of people do, or they try and find a solution and they rush off, actually, there is no space for your wife to discover what it's like to be living alone. You know, she could find that it's going to be something that she doesn't actually want. There's quite a lot of people who leave the family home and decide, actually, this isn't what I want. It could be that if you are being the better person, that um, she's going to start to have a, a different viewpoint of you. You sort of don't know. You have to sit in the uncertainty, and that is the hardest thing to do. But if you can do it, then there are all sorts of possibilities that open up. Do you want to comment on anything I've just said, Jeffrey? No, I think you gave a, a lot of very good, very specific in the moment pieces of advice. I think we sort of hit this response on two, two different levels, one a broader level, but one a very specific, do this here and at this time. So I thought your responses were great. And I think we need both of those things. We need the oversight and we need the granular kind of stuff. And, you know, it could be that what you need is a, a therapist that you're going to speak to this stuff about and that you can pour out that anxiety. It's okay to be anxious. It's not okay to pass your anxiety over to your wife to package up and resolve for you. That is a really difficult thing to say, but that is the truth. And in a sense, what you were sort of doing in the past was handing over your problems to your wife. Well, actually, it was the worst of both worlds. You were, you were hoping that she was going to take the parcel of your problems and solve them, but you actually held on to them so tightly she couldn't. So we had the worst of both worlds. But now you're doing the good stuff. You're beginning to engage with your problems. And I think you've just got to be patient with yourself, with the whole thing unfolding, sit with the uncertainty, because you don't know how it's going to unfold. I hope that was helpful. And if anybody else would like something like that, the address once again, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, and you'll go and see a form that says participate in the program. So we've reached that point in the program where I have to ask you what makes your life meaningful? I think relationships would have to be the one thing that trying to make as meaningful as they can be. At my stage in life, I've been around for a while. It's always important to recognize where I am, where I'm situated, how my relationships can be fulfilling now and how they can be made better in the future. 
So this is the point where we're going to end the main podcast, but the conversation continues that uh, Jeffrey was talking about in-law relationships. That's his latest book. And how you get on with your in-laws actually is going to have a huge impact on how you get on with your brother or sister. And in fact, a lot of people find that this is the point (laughs) that their relationship with their brother or sister goes down the toilet. So how do you manage these relationships? We'll be finding out and talking about all of that in the bonus material. And if you want to hear that bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.